things that the world has gone through over the centuries, how the body has changed over the years, and how we can avoid some of the common pitfalls in the practice of many churches today. And so, Father, we pray that you'd be with us this morning, that you would lead, guide, and direct this meeting this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, I, I don't want to forget this, so I want to greet Melissa, Linda, and Sheila, who are watching us this morning. They're attending with us this morning. And... Uh, Emeritus Avery Blue and Kristen, his wife, and some folks down in Knoxville, Tennessee are with us this morning. <clears throat> we uh, are continuing our series on spiritual gifts, and those of you that weren't here or weren't in attendance online over the past two weeks, you're going to want to go back and look at the YouTube uh, videos of those teachings because in there we gave the background, the cultural background uh, in which the Corinthian church found itself. The, the background that it came out of, which was characterized um, by its devotion to the mystery religions. Uh, the mystery religions were nothing new. We gave the background of that and it's information that you can find online. I want to recommend to you uh, the work of a man by the name of Samuel Angus. Samuel Angus is a historian who has wrote extensively on the mystery religions and their impact on the New Testament church, particularly the church at Corinth. Okay, it'll give you a, a good background and explain the, <clears throat> the, the mystery religions that they grew up in, uh, their pagan backgrounds, and they drag the trimmings and trappings of those practices of their pagan worship into the Corinthian church, which is why Paul had to write to straighten out the problems that they were having in the Corinthian church. They, uh, 1 Corinthians is written solely to address problems. Uh, the entire book is written to address problems in the church. And... <clears throat> It follows that chapters 12 through 14, uh, the chapters on spiritual gifts, were also written to address problems. And in particular, the problems with the misuse, abuse, and abuse of spiritual gifts. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, that continues in much of Christianity today. Much of Christianity. Why are spiritual gifts important? because Christ has given every believer his Holy Spirit. That's Romans 8, verse 9. If any man has not the Spirit of God, he doesn't belong to God. So every Christian has a Holy Spirit. There just aren't any others. You know, you have people that say, well, I'm a charismatic Christian. Well, everybody in here who knows the Lord Jesus Christ is a charismatic Christian in the technical sense of the word. That's one of those words that's been hijacked by a certain segment of Christianity, okay? I'm as charismatic as any Christian that's ever lived because charisma simply means grace, grace gifts, and every believer, according to 1 Peter 4 and 10, has been given a spiritual gift. Now, why does, that, why did, does the scripture say gift instead of gifts, and why do I say that? I'm glad you ask. <laughs> you see, have you ever received a present that had guys like a shirt, a tie, and a pair of cufflinks? I'm dating myself. People don't wear cufflinks. I do. But <laughs> okay. In the same box. Okay. There are several things in there, but that is your gift. Singular. Okay. Such it is with spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts, you may have two, three, four, five spiritual gifts. We're not all the same. And those gifts don't manifest themselves all in the same way. You're like an artist and an artist's palette when he's painting a, a portrait. 
he'll have all these colors on the palette, and he'll take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of that, and it comes out a certain color. So it is with spiritual gifts. We're like spiritual snowflakes. No two gifted believers, those gifts don't manifest themselves the same way. Okay? Uh, one of our pastors and I have very similar gifting. Okay? But, but uh, we don't look alike. I mean, it's that, the, tall, the taller one. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we have very similar gifting in my, in my measured opinion and, but they, they manifest the gifting manifests itself totally different in both of us because that's how God has made us so we want to uh, dig deeply we're not rushing through this series at all Okay, part of the problem with uh, the church today, who is to be the representative of Jesus Christ in the world, is the misuse and abuse and misunderstanding of spiritual gifts. Okay, <clears throat> Christ manifest himself first, the first time, through the incarnation in the world. Okay, but once he left and went back to heaven... He intends to continue to manifest himself in the church and in the world through us. And the means by which he does that is through spiritual gifts. <clears throat> now, the Corinthian church had corrupted the gifting, the misuse and abuse of the gifts. They had all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Let's say you decided that <clears throat> you were visiting Corinth one Sunday and you said, Wife, let's go down to the first church of Corinth and have our hearts blessed. So we go down, and, and we get there, and we're right on time. But the rich people have been there for an hour or so, okay? And they've, so they've already started eating the love feast. See, we don't have these in the church today, and it's a tragedy, okay? The early church had love feast where they came together and broke bread together. It's a wonderful way to fellowship. Wonderful way to fellowship. But they, we get there on time, but the rich people have already been there for an hour, and they've, they're eating up the love feast. <laughs> okay. And <clears throat> the poor people come in the same time we do because they had to work. Okay. And the, and the rich people are over there, and they've eaten up the love feast. They're, and they, we find out that they're having a wonderful time because they're stoned. They've been drinking all the wine at the same time. And, and in the first century, they drank more wine than water because water was kill you, okay? <laughs> That's why Paul said to Timothy, he said, take a little wine for your stomach. Don't drink that water. That'll kill you, okay? But they have drank up the wine, and they're bombed. Okay, and of course the poor people come in. We do, and when we do, and they're not happy about it because, in that time, one third of the world's population was slaves. So the love feast on on the first day on Sunday would be the best meal that some people had all week. Okay, because everybody brought their it was a potluck type thing. Everybody brought their dish, and of course they would have very meager fare. But the rich people who had all the good food had gotten there an hour early and eaten it up. Okay, and then somebody brings up an issue and they argue about it and they hassle about it. Okay, because in their culture, arguing and hassling and debating was a thing. Remember Paul on Mars Hill? Okay, and then they announced that, well, it's time for the Lord's Supper. Okay, and they abuse it. Remember, the, the poor people haven't had anything to eat, so they eat it up. You know, they eat up the elements and drink up the wine. Okay? Not grape juice, Baptist. It was wine. Uh, <laughs> not grape juice. In fact, the first miracle Jesus performed, it was not turning the water into grape juice. Okay? Uh, <laughs> but, but they eat it up. Okay? And they abuse it. And Paul writes chapter 11 to correct the abuse of the Lord's table. He said, because of this, many of you are sick, and God took some of you home, okay? 
like I said, every chapter in 1 Corinthians was written to address a problem. And so they eat it up, they abuse it. He said, don't you have homes to eat in? I mean, that's in chapter 11. You can look that up for yourself. But then somebody makes the, the announcement that, well, it's time to worship. And so the worship starts. And there is no order whatsoever. Somebody over here is given a word of, of wisdom, and somebody over here a word of knowledge, and somebody over here is babbling in nonsense gibberish, which was characteristic of the mystery religions. Okay? Ecstatic speech, just nonsense gibberish, not a language at all. Okay? And, and so this place is chaotic, and, and I look at my wife and say, I think this is a weird church. <laughs> and, and, and if we have a, a visitor that came with us that's unsaved, that person's going to think they're what? They're mad. That's exactly what Paul wrote in chapter 14. Okay? So they had dragged the trimmings and trappings of the mystery religions into their former pagan life, into the worship service, and there was total chaos. So <clears throat> we spent the last two weeks setting the context of that. And again, uh, if you weren't with us, uh, please uh, go and, and, uh, and take a look at those YouTubes because uh, that gives you the basis, the background, the foundation for our series on spiritual gifts. All right? Now let's go to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're finally going to get into the first three verses. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Can you believe that we haven't gotten that far? Yes, some of you can believe that. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 12. It says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Okay, let's hold there a minute. We want to talk about the importance of spiritual gifts. The importance of spiritual gifts first. Very, very important. Now, <clears throat> you'll notice if you have an annotated Bible that the word gifts is in italics. It's really not there. The translators put that in to help us understand what he's talking about, the reading. Okay. So the word gifts is supplied by the translators. Um, the Greek word is actually pneumatikos. P-N-E-U-M-A-T-I-K. Pneumaticon, actually, to be technical. Pneumatikos. Pneuma, where we get the word for pneumatics, it's the word for breath or air. Or spirit. Anytime you see a word in Greek with an I-K ending, it means described by, described by, or controlled by. whatever the word, rest of that word means. So spiritual gifts, spirituals, is actually what's translated there, S-P-I-R-I-T-U-A-L-S, spirituals, concerning spirituals. <clears throat> it is something that is described by or characterized by or controlled by the Holy Spirit. So whatever these spirituals are, they are described by or in control by the Holy Spirit. And there are five different terms in this section of 1 Corinthians 12 uh, to describe spiritual gifts in this one section. So this one term tells us that they are characterized and controlled by the Holy Spirit. 
whatever they are. <clears throat> now, what is he talking about that is described by this word? Well, spirituals is the way it's technically translated. And in Greek, it's, it's, we don't know if it's masculine or neuter form because they're both the same. So what is he talking about? Some interpreters will tell you that he's talking about spiritual persons as opposed to those he's been writing about heretofore in 1 Corinthians. Okay? That cannot be so. That cannot be so. Hold your place there and turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Remember 12, 13, and 14 are a unit all about spiritual gifts. So 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1 says, Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. There he cannot be talking about persons. He is only talking about gifts. So the same author in the same uh, book writing about the same topic, spiritual gifts, he must be talking about spiritual gifts and not spiritual persons. Same letter. He's talking about spiritual gifts, not spiritual persons. So <clears throat> the word, this same word, spirituals, is always used in the New Testament in some way related to the Holy Spirit, with one exception. So somebody was going to say, well, what about Ephesians 6.12? There it's talking about Satan, Okay. So every other place in your New Testament, that term describes some, something that's related to the Holy Spirit. So Paul wants to make sure that the Corinthians have a clear and complete understanding of spiritual gifts. Why? Because that is the only means that God uses in presenting himself in the church and in the world. It's through spiritual gifts. See, when God saved you, he gave you his spirit, and the moment you were saved, he gave you a gift. Now, you may not know what it is yet, okay? You may not know what it is yet. Just like when you're born biologically, you're born with natural talents, okay? I was born with a talent for playing basketball, and I'd never seen one, <laughs> okay? Didn't see one until about the sixth or seventh grade, even. I might have been really good if I'd have started in third grade. But, but oh, I don't know if I hadn't bad, had bad hips. But, but you know, modern medicine is wonderful. They gave me two new, two new ones. It's a wonderful thing. But, but uh, you're born with natural talents, and you don't know what they are. You have to discover them, and then you have to develop them to be efficient in using them. So it is with spiritual gifts. The day you came to Christ, he gave you your spiritual gifts or gift. You may not know what it is yet, and we're going to talk um, weeks ahead about how to discover your gifting, okay, so that you can put your gifting to use because that is the means by which the church is built up and by which the world sees Christ. They saw him in his incarnation in the flesh. Now they see him in the flesh through you and me. Okay? So spiritual gifts are vitally important. <clears throat> Paul had just finished slamming the Corinthian church in chapter 11, verses 18 through 34, about their misuse and abuse of the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. And now he lights into them on spiritual gifts. And it's like saying, he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, chapter 12, verse 1, it's like saying, okay, and the second thing I want to talk to you about is spiritual gifts. He's already talked to them about their abuse of the Lord's table. Okay, so in context, this is the second thing that he's talking about. And he says, I do not want you to be unaware do not want you to be unaware. This is a phrase Paul uses frequently when he wants to have his readers pay close attention to a spiritual truth. Really, really important. You can find it in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Uh, you can find it in Romans 11.25. We won't go, go, go there. 
but <clears throat> it's a phrase that Paul uses when he really wants to grab his reader's attention. Really important. He said, I would not have you be ignorant. Ignorant. It's the word agnoio in Greek. <laughs> okay, I won't. <laughs> I won't. Just go ahead and manifest it yourself. But <laughs> <laughs> Man, by now, you ought to know I have automatic responses. They're not always politically correct. <laughs> but Paul said, I would not have you be ignorant. This is where we get this word agnostic from. Okay. Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant when it comes to spiritual gifts because they're so important. They're critically important. The church, the ignorance must end in the body of Christ concerning spiritual gifts. We have, we live in a time when the church is so jacked up because of the ignorance of spiritual gifts. And they think, people think that because it happens in the church, it's got to be of the Holy Spirit. No. Satan counterfeits. The Bible's very clear on that, and he goes to church more than you do. Absolutely. And he'd much rather disrupt you as a believer, since he couldn't keep you from being saved, than he can keep you from being effective. How does he do that? By counterfeiting spiritual gifts, and it's happening all over the body of Christ today. And Paul's saying the ignorance must end. I don't want you to be ignorant about spiritual gifts because of the critical nature of their, their importance in the, in the ministry. So the church cannot function, believers cannot mature, the world cannot be evangelized without spiritual gifts. That's how important they are. So we, we can't have ignorance related to spiritual gifts. <clears throat> it's really, really, really important. In fact, the, the Apostle Paul really, he, he set them up. See how he used the word brethren? If you notice in the writings of Paul, if he really wants to hit them with something, his readers with something really hard, he refers to them as brethren. You know, like he's coming alongside and brethren, and then he gives them that punch in the rib. <laughs> Okay, so, this is one of those, okay? This is one of those. Paul was a, a master at that. So don't assume because it happens in the church that it's of the Holy Spirit. Satan goes to church more than you do. Masquerades as an angel of light. And, and there's a ditch on both sides of the road, and he doesn't care which one he wrecks you in, Okay? So we can't be ignorant about spiritual gifts. <clears throat> now, verses 2 and 3. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols or dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, in studying on spiritual gifts, one of the things that I found that you, you see in most commentaries, and I read about 20 commentaries just to see, you know, if there was any mainstream there and if I was in it. <laughs> okay, that's really important. Um, it's interesting that most of them hurry past verses 2 and 3 to get to verse 4 to start talking about spiritual gifts. But verses 2 and 3, inspired by the Holy Spirit, are very, very critical in our understanding of what Paul's addressing here and what's going on. Very, very important. He said, you know you were pagans. Pagans. That's verse 2. The word is Gentile. Gentile. In the technical sense, it represents all non-Jews. 
But in your New Testament, many times, it's, it not only represents non-Jews, but it represents non-Christians. Okay? And that's the sense that Paul is using it here. Uh, for the sake of time, write it down in your notes. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 5, and 1 Peter 2, verse 12. In those locations, Paul is using it the same way it is used here to define the non-Christian. What was the 1 Peter verse? 1 Peter 2, 12. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 5. So you know that you were, he's talking to believers now. Remember, he just called them brethren. Nobody is referred to in the New Testament as brother or sister unless they are saved. Now, in a human sense, sometimes Paul refers to the Jews as his brethren. Okay, but that's strictly in an ethnic sense. Other than that, nobody's referred to in the New Testament as a brother or a sister who is not a Christian. Okay? And, and Christians in the New Testament are never referred to by secular titles. So what does that say about these preachers that want to be called Reverend Doctor somebody? <laughs> You won't find that in the book, guys. It's not there. Tells you something. When you call him by a secular title, you diminish that believer's status. There's no higher status than them being a brother or sister, child of God. So when you refer to him as Reverend Doctor, <laughs> you, just, you, you, you thought you elevated that person, but spiritually, you, you just diminish their status before God. But we can't think that way because we think Madison Avenue, right? <laughs> All right. So he says, you were pagans, talking to believers, and now he characterizes their paganism, carried away unto these dumb idols even as you were led. One of the chief characteristics of most pagan religions is idolatry. Idolatry. And remember, they came out of that mystery religion, pagan idolatrous system, and Paul was addressing that. He said, even as you were led, you were led astray once upon a time to these dumb idols, led astray. Uh, that word is often used of prisoners being taken for execution or for imprisonment. All through your New Testament, that's the way it's, written, it's, it's, it's used. So you, when you were pagans, were led away, carried away. This is not something you volunteered for. This is something that has come up on you. You see, everybody's going to worship, even the atheist. Everybody worships, okay? You don't, you don't decide whether or not to worship. You only decide what or whom to worship. Okay, there aren't any exceptions. Okay, God is the cry of man's soul to worship. God created us that way. So everybody worships. Some are into self worship, others are into idol worship. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I know Adam. Uh, <laughs> but, but everybody worships somewhere. Everybody. Okay, And he says, you were led away, you were carried away, you were dragged away to the worship of these dumb idols in your paganistic culture, in your paganistic background. That's what you used to do. And you know, one of the big misconceptions of the, of the lost man is, and, and you've no doubt heard, heard him say this, well, you know, I would become a Christian, but you know, I like my freedom. I want, I want to make my own decisions. I want to do what I want to do. Okay. And, and I've got a friend that of about 20 years, he still says that same thing. And I've referred him to this passage and others. I said, no, no, you don't understand. You're like a dumb moron being dragged away by a ring in your nose. You're not doing what you want to do. You're being dragged away, carried away. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20.
And Paul here is talking about idolatry. Verse 19, what do I mean then that a thing sacrificed to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. You see, it doesn't matter who or what a person is worshiping, if they're worshiping someone other than the God of the universe, the God of the Bible, they are into idol worship, pagan worship. And they're not doing it because that's what they want to do. They're being dragged away into that, according to the very words of God. Okay? So the lost man thinking that he's doing what he wants to do is... is, is There's no deception like self-deception. He's being dragged away, carried away. The unbeliever is captive to sin, Paul tells us in Romans 6. So it doesn't matter who or what he's worshiping. He doesn't, uh, he has only the choice of the type of sin, not whether to sin. Really, really important. So Paul says, however you were led. So you had no choice whether you went willingly or whatever. You were led away. And this is one of those texts that disputes that. That lost man has freedom over what he's going to do. Okay. And again, I referenced Romans 6 verse 17 uh, for your notes. You see, unbelievers are not only bound and being led away, but 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says that they are blinded by the God of this world. Okay? Blinded by the God of this world. That's a serious condition. Serious condition. Unbelievers think they're free because they are deceived unknowingly, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. That's Titus 3.3. 3. And Romans chapter 2, verse 5 speaks of the hardness of heart. Let's look at that one. I want us to see that one just a second. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We'll start at verse 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness, God's kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? So he's holding his wrath off of the lost person and being kind to that lost person, giving him common grace to draw him to repentance. But because of your stubbornness and unpenitent heart, You are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds. So the lost man, the longer he stubbornly refuses to bow the knee to Jesus Christ, is storing up wrath. Who is stupid enough to want to store up the wrath of God against them? Of Almighty God. The hardness of heart, uh, cardiosclerosis. Okay. <laughs> Isn't that right, Doc? <laughs> cardiosclerosis. The, you see, you, know, you have hardening of the arteries, arterial sclerosis, and that'll lead you to the grave, but cardiosclerosis will lead you to hell. Okay, and that's what's going on here. That's what Paul's talking about. And that's where the lost man finds himself. You know, part of the unbeliever's bondage is to worship false gods. And the, the atheist and the agnostic both fall into that trap. Each is a slave. Paul says back to 1 Corinthians 12, he says that they're led away being led away to dumb idols, not dumb in as in unintelligent, but dumb as in can't speak, can't give answers, can't give you any guidance. An idol is nothing. They have no ability 
uh, no matter how primitive or sophisticated, they have no ability to speak, to give you information that's necessary. Okay? <clears throat> so he says, you were led away, you Corinthian brothers and sisters. In your previous paganistic life, you were led away to dumb idols, idols that have nothing to help you. They have nothing whatsoever. I mean, that's the guy that's standing there making a carving and carving his God. That's Romans chapter 1. You know, give over their worship to birds and animals and four-footed things and their carvings and, and, and their depiction of Christ on a crucifix. Did I say that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's idolatry. That's right. That's what it is. That's right. I'm too old. What are they gonna do to me? <laughs> now <laughs> and that's a great out, I really am. <laughs> so so now you say, well wait a minute. How? Well, yeah. Flame out, man. <laughs> let it all hang out and let the big end drag. <laughs> so he's been talking about, in verse 1, spiritual gifts. So what's the connection here? Okay. He goes from talking about spirituals in verse 1 to talking about these, this, their idolatry in verse 2 and 3. So what's the connection? Well, the connection comes in the last phrase in verse 2. Even as you were led. That's a passive verb. This happened to them. They are victims. Victims of those demons that drag them into false worship. This verb is one of irresistible leading. So this is not something they chose. This has come up on them. It's used in the same way in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. Paul says, For of this sort are they who creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with various lusts. So it implies a leading. This is exactly the same verb. This is something that has happened to them. <clears throat> so there were victims. Paul said, you were victims. You were led away by the demons into worship of false gods. And the result was you got yourself into a pagan religion in ex ecstasy and enthusiasm that we've talked about in previous sessions. And you were led away into that pagan worship. Now you brought those old, same old patterns of worship into the church. Now, do you see the importance of verses 2 and 3? If you skip over them and rush to study spiritual gifts, you've missed the whole foundation of what the apostle is talking about, of the problems that he is addressing. You don't want to miss that. The Holy Spirit does not misuse, abuse, misplace, or displace words. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by what? Every word. So anytime you leap over something in God's word to rush to meteor, what you think is meteor territory, you just left something laying that you're going to want and that you really need to understand what's being said. Paul says, look, you can't distinguish between the demonic and the divine. Why? Because you drag those pagan practices into the church. I had a friend who's a leader in one of these churches that does a lot of this stuff. And I said, you know, when somebody jumps up and starts babbling in nonsense gibberish, how do you know what's going on there? He said, well, it's got to be of the Holy Spirit. You can't deny this experience. I said, okay, let me ask you this. Do you believe Satan counterfeits? He said, yeah, the Bible says that. How do you know the difference? You don't even know what they're saying. 
Okay, they could be cussing you. <laughs> you don't even know. So how in the world can you discern what's of the Holy Spirit and what's of other spirits that visit the church more often than you do? You can't. You can't. So here's what Paul's saying. The truly spiritual, and don't miss this, the truly spiritual is not marked by being carried away. It is not marked by being swept away. It is not marked by being blown away in emotion and enthusiastic whirling dervishes and dancing and hopping and jumping and falling out, slain in the spirit. Oh, my brother. Yeah, you were slain all right. <laughs> the Holy Spirit doesn't conduct himself. And Paul's saying that right here. The truly spiritual is not characterized by being swept away. My niece, when I went down to do my sister's eulogy, she said, oh, oh, J.D., the other night the Holy Spirit had his way with us in church, man. I mean, there was people shouting and people speaking in tongues, and, 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 and man, it was just awesome. I mean, it was just a most glorious time. We didn't, have, the pastor didn't even have time to preach. That's what she said. <laughs> That's what she said. You see, just like the Corinthians who came out of the mystery religions, emphasis was given on the emotional complex spending itself rather than the context or content of what's being said. Okay. It's happening all over the church right now. Guys, this is, this is not something that simply happened to the Corinthians. This is happening as we speak. I mean, they're involved big time. Our pastors this, just this morning and yesterday in text were talking about some of these guys that are being elevated by people like Oprah and people like that. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about a fat girl from the hood made good. Okay? I'm not going to talk about her. <laughs> See, if you say that, they'll call you racist. But, <laughs> but I'm not, not going to talk about that. <laughs> but if you want a bestseller, just get her to say the name of your book. Um, <laughs> But she's honoring some one of these guys, and I'm not going to call his name. I do call names. I'm not opposed to that. Okay. Oh, what are they going to do to me? Uh, the Bible calls names. Okay. Um, Furtick was his name. Is that, is that what? Yeah, him, that guy. Um, Oprah was, yeah, that guy. I'm not going to hold it up because they're waiting with cameras. <laughs> 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 He got me two weeks ago. <laughs> he laid it up here because he knew I was going to pick it up and go, look at what somebody put up here. And he just says, click. <laughs> Next comes the memes and all of that. <laughs> they educated me on that. But, but Oprah's honoring this guy, Stephen Furtick, uh, who is basically a heretic. Oh, no, he's not basically. <laughs> I'm not kidding. He absolutely, he denies much about the truth of Scripture. He is absolutely a heretic. And if any of your friends are listening to him, I would caution them that they are definitely listening to somebody that will lead them into damnation. Yes. Yeah, he is not a preacher. So he's not basically he's a heretic. Not a preacher, he's not Christian. <laughs> no, he is not. There's no. nothing Christian about him. No. You're absolutely right. See, I told you we call names. Yeah. That, that was my pastor, for those of you who can't see him, one of them. And the other one's just like him. Uh, <laughs> By the way, I'll just say this, you know, I have to be careful that they, I wouldn't listen to any music that comes out of these places either. Like mm -hmm. Hill songs, places like that, it is fraught with heresy and error. Yes. Uh, and you're just, uh, and then when you purchase those songs and stuff, you're just feeding a system uh, that promotes itself and that is anti-Christian. Mm -hmm. Is anti-Christ is what it is. Mm -hmm. It sounds good, but it is not good. 
you know, see, the funny thing is, is in the world, uh, the false religions don't have a sign above them that says this way to hell. That's they right. Have a sign above them that says this way to heaven. That's right. You know, if you're not discerning it scripturally, uh, you know, it, it's problematic. Absolutely. That's why I'm entirely against soft church. You know, you, you know, hard define doctrine define creates, that hard term. Doctrine creates soft hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, true doctrine creates soft hearts. It's the false doctrine that is out there that is being promoted. This emotive stuff that is not scripturally found that creates a lot of false religions that leads people into a, a large and long false pathway. Mm. Uh, mm. And it's just it's just it's it's highly disturbing. So anyway, amen. I'm done. Mm. No, that's good. We need, we need every bit of that. <laughs> that is a fact. That is a fact. Um, and, you know, people get, many believers say, but Jim, you're going to offend them. Well, where are you going to drive them to? Hell number two? <laughs> offend them. The most loving thing you can do with anyone is simply tell them the truth. The most loving thing you can do. <clears throat> so Paul here is saying the truly spiritual is not characterized by being swept away. Now let me put it where you can get it. I'm going to make sure you don't miss it. The truly spiritual is not marked by trances, being slain in the spirit, babbling in nonsense gibberish, running around the, the auditorium with flags. Some dude standing up, he's cut, he's buff, he, he goes to the gym every day and he's got on this Roman thing. I saw that in the church here. And he's got a broadsword while the pastor is praying all over the meeting on Sunday morning. He's sitting there brandishing this broadsword. He's supposed to represent the sword of the Lord. Can you believe that? <laughs> You know, what amazes me is not what people won't believe, but what they'll fall for. Staying in the church like that, the evidence that you're not, you don't have the spirit. If you're in there and you stay there. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying, and I'm not saying that a person could not be saved by going there. I'm saying that he can't stay. There's no way he can stay. Couldn't possibly stay there. If the Holy Spirit is truly indwelling you, the Holy Spirit is going to have an allergic reaction to that foolishness. Because it doesn't square with the book. It doesn't square with Scripture. And when somebody gets up to, to give a prophecy, or, get, or it, if it agrees with the Word of God, it's unnecessary. If it doesn't, it's heresy. It's real simple. It doesn't agree with the Spirit that supposedly lives in that. Bottom line. Yeah. yeah. So your, your filter is to be the Word of God. If it agrees with the Word of God, it's not necessary. When somebody comes to me and says, Brother, I have a word from the Lord for you. I say, give me chapter and verse, man. Lay it on me. <laughs> okay. Oh, you don't have chapter and verse? Then stop eating spicy food before you go to bed, and you won't have those problems. <laughs> That's just keeping it real. <laughs> So you ask, well, then, Jim, how are they slain? How are they, these people that claim to be slain in the spirit? How, how does that happen? Well, I don't know. In some cases, you know, there's a guy standing behind you waiting to catch you, and you want to be part of it, so you just fall down. <laughs> okay. And when they're spraying for you, they pop you in the forward, you know, and make sure you've got a little momentum to go back. Okay. And... <laughs> Oh, yes. So you'll find that in these ministries, these churches will build up the emotional. Uh, and Starting with the music. With the music. Yep. And then there's a whole lot of emotionalism involved. Yeah. So that by the time <coughs> they get around to the, we're going to start slaying folks in the spirit, you are so emotionally high strung mm -hmm. that you are, you are anticipating yeah. something to happen. And it's that anticipation that actually causes in some cases, that's those it. people that have those kinds of 
slain in the experience, was slain in the spirit experiences. And they they use Revelation where John says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day and he fell before the one speaking as a man who is dead. They say, well, see, that's slain in the spirit. No, it's not. If the Lord Jesus Christ suddenly appeared here, we would not be looking at each other nor him. We'd be on our faces in front of him. Amen. Amen. It's just amazing what people will believe, what they'll fall for. Just amazing. But the Spirit of God does not operate the gifts of the Spirit when you are out of control. I want to say it again and say it with emphasis. The Spirit of God does not operate in your life when you are out of control. All spiritual gifts are used with the full will and consciousness of the user. No exceptions, no exclusions. So this foolishness that, that's going on, that, that, that's not the work of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, and 23. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness, long-suffering, and what? Self-control. The Spirit of God is not manifesting Himself through your life when you are out of control. Amen. These are the very words of God. <laughs> you know, when, when we first moved to, to Pennsylvania, my family and I visited a local church. Was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, <laughs> see, see what I mean? <laughs> this is my. <laughs> This is my life. I do life with these guys. <laughs> I do life with these guys. <laughs> and, and they love me. Can you believe that? <laughs> but we went, to, we visited a local, how do they put it? Church based, church based organization. CBO, yeah, yeah church-based organization. We hesitate to call, them, to, to call some places churches. <laughs> okay, so they're church-based organizations. And we visited one of those, and we're sitting there, you know, and the kids were small. And this dude on the organ, you know, is playing a prelude to the, you know, to the worship. And it was wonderful, you know, that, that was really kind of neat, you know, how they do that. And then they're right, brother. <laughs> Sorry, our pianist <laughs> is sitting there. He he was doing this, and all of a sudden, he starts singing in tongues, oh. singing in nonsense gibberish. And and you know, I had an immediate allergic reaction to that. And and I looked down the row and said, "Hey, all that are called by my name, see that door? Find it now. We are out of here." I, I cannot abide that. I just can't abide that because there are spirits at work, but none of them are holy when that kind of stuff goes on. Very important. Look at chapter 14, verse 33 of 1 Corinthians. And we're being chased by the clock, so we need to hurry. We don't have to hurry. We have the freedom. The pastor said I didn't need to hurry. so Both of them said it, so I'm, I'm going to take them at that. <laughs> okay. For God is not the author of what? Confusion. Confusion. Now, you cannot honestly say that when this kind of stuff is going on in a place of worship, that it is not confusing. It's most confusing. Look down at verse 40. Let all things be done what? Indecently and out of order? No. Decently and in order. The Spirit of God does not operate the gifts of God when you are out of control, when you're in some kind of supernatural trance. Doesn't happen. 
And anytime that stuff goes on, it is never, I say never, underscore, never of God. Never. And just to show you how bizarre that this had become in the Corinthian church, go back to chapter 12, look at verse 3. This is how the demons were really feeling their oats in here. Paul writes, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So here you had, they were so out of control, so undiscerning about what was of the Spirit and what wasn't of the Spirit that somebody, and I read 20 different commentaries on this, and nobody disagreed with me, that this was actually going on in the worship service. While all this chaos is going on, somebody's giving a word of prophecy, somebody's giving a word of knowledge, somebody's babbling in nonsense gibberish, and somebody jumps up and says, Jesus is anathema. Cursed. Oh, bless you, brother, there's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> now, if somebody jumped up in this room right now in a body of believers and said, Jesus is accursed, would you think that was of the Holy Spirit? No, we know something wrong with that dude. You know, and keep him over there in that corner and don't let him out. Because <laughs> something's wrong with that guy. We've had several interesting instances here. But we had one, one time where somebody said they walked through the, the, you know, where the restrooms are on this side of the building, too. And he said he was being chased by a hissing demon on the <laughs> top uh, rails up there and that we needed to excise the building. A hissing demon. A hissing demon. Yeah. Had invaded. Covering over the children's ministry, hissing at <laughs> Whoa. 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 Now see, see how jacked up things are? And in many churches, they would have went and broken out the olive oil. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Huh? Because a lot of that truth is about the elevation of that pastor. Yeah. And he's going to jump out with, yeah. the, with, the, with the olive oil and then let me lay hands on you. Yeah. You know, all pastors lay hands on people. Let me, let me add one thing to what you said there, and you're 100% correct. Yes. In, in everything that is there. It's not the elevation of God. And mm -hmm. as I've said many times before here, the problem is of many of these churches, they preach a very small God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a tiny yeah. God, right, that is that is a God in their making, mm -hmm. a small G. It's not mm -hmm. the God of the Scripture, mm -hmm. uh, what they're preaching. Uh, and if you don't know the Word, you're not going to know what that God is, yeah. what, what the true God is. I mean, they'll break. You your olive oil or whatever, whatever you do, your, you know, or discount market oil. Yeah, unprescribed and it, it's embarrassing, really. It really uh, is. It's an affront to God. Amen. It is. Yeah. It is. Now the Israelites are happy about the olive oil because they're the greatest um, producers of yeah, olive oil yeah, in the world. So, so, <laughs> so, so they're happy about the oil. Keep using it oil. <laughs> <laughs> but Paul here gives us a negative and a positive test here um, by which you can determine. Um, and let's quickly get a little bit of that. The negative test. He says, no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus Christ accursed. And again, the word accursed, it's a Jewish word, anathema, anathema means condemnation, okay? Very strong term. Um, <clears throat> and since they were into the trappings of their pagan religion and the more mysterious it seemed, the more religious it seemed to them, they couldn't discern the difference, okay? And Paul has to straighten that out. It says, no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus Christ accursed, and I'll go one step further. It's a Jewish word, and it may have been a Jewish believer. Why? Because of Deuteronomy 21, 23. Write that in your notes. Deuteronomy 21, 23. 
Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And so that was one of the criticisms that the Jews had of Christians claiming that Jesus was the Messiah because he was hanged on a tree. And they said, how can you worship him? The scripture says, cursed is anyone that hangs on a tree. So this may have been a Jewish, a Jewish believer or several of them that were saying this. And, and what that was, that was even in the first century, they had begun the development of Gnosticism. The Gnostic belief that all flesh is evil and spirit is good. And so the spirit left Jesus the man before he was crucified on the cross, came on him at his baptism, left him before he was crucified on the cross, so he died as a mere man. That's the heresy that was being battled here and also in the Colossian church. So this may have been why somebody would do this, but what's the problem with that? If Jesus died as a man, why are we here? And to give more evidence, Paul had to write chapter 15 to talk about this very issue. If Jesus is not ridden, risen, we are men most miserable. So it may have been that Gnostic heresy that already started to creep into the Corinthian church at this time that someone would stand in the worship service with all this chaos and say, Jesus is accursed. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop right there as we, we're out of time. We always run out of time, <laughs> but praise the Lord. Yes, I did.